Now the ACP guideline or guidance statement is not even a guidance statement. It's not even a review article. How many of you have read it actually? It's not even a review article. Forget a guideline or a guidance statement. So let's look at the guidance statement. Clinicians should personalize goals for a glycemic control in patients with type 2 diabetes on the basis and discussion of benefits and harms. What's the level of ed evidence? What's new in this statement? The ADA says this. Clinicians should aim to achieve an HbA1c between 7 to 8 percent in most patients with type 2 diabetes. What is the level of it? What is most patients? Which evidence prompted ACB to make these recommendations? If you look at the ADA recommendation, that providers might reasonably suggest that a more stringent goal for selected individual, if this can be achieved without significant hypo or other effects of polypharmacy. So it's very, very clear what the ADA says. Again, the ACP says we looked at five long-term randomized control trials. If you look at it, where is the fifth one? Was it a typo error in this ACP guidance statement? They didn't proofread it also properly. Look at what the ADA has, has all that data or the ADA 2019 guideline for choosing the A1C target has looked at all these kind of data before they came up with these guidelines. And the most important thing that what is diabetes? Diabetes is when the microvascular system ticks when the blood sugar goes high. And the A1C is 6.5. The ACP article completely ignored but we know that when the A1C is above 6.5, the retina starts sticking with the high blood sugar. This was the look on my face and on Altamash's face when he said A1C 7 to 8 percent. So I'm a clinician. For me, treating patients to goal is extremely important. I need to improve their quality of life, reduce their comorbid conditions, and make them live a healthy life. So the ADA 2019 recommendations has recommended that Treatment goals be individualized based on factors both modifiable and non-modifiable, such as age, life expectancy, duration of diabetes, what's the support and comorbid condition. The ADA recommends that a reasonable A1C goal for many non-pregnant adults with type 2 diabetes is less than 7% based on the Accord Advanced VADT and the UKPDS trials. So they recommend a 7%. They also look that the approach to management should look at a lot of patient and disease-related features and not just the, the glycemic numbers. So in, uh, in patients who are at very high risk for hypoglycemia, have limited life expectancy or extensive comorbid condition, you could look at something less than 8%. Again, reassessed targets over time based on criteria and in older adults. So these are the four associations which look at different targets. We are going to look at this the ADA versus the ACP target of 7 to 8%. Now, we, when we look at an HbA1c, also you need to look at the legacy of the HbA1c. How long has it been over a period of time? It's not a spot thing that one looks at. It's the legacy also of HbA1c. Now, when we look at goals, goals are goals, but our best evidence suggests that an A1c level attained and how it is approached is probably the crux of the matter to achieve op optimal outcomes. The goal of an A1C less than 7% is fundamentally a tactic to achieve a strategy to minimize the risk of complications while maintaining quality of life. There are a lot of dire consequences to this alternate target of 7 to 8%. Though the, the whole debate is on type 2 diabetes, I'll take you all back to the DCCT which is on type 1 diabetes because type 1 diabetes is a real good medium to actually understand a glycemic strategy because you don't have much insulin resistance. And if you look at the DCCT, where the contrast between the intensive and conventional was between 7% and 9% over six years, the, the three-step progression of retinopathy reduced by 76%, the kidney by almost 50%, and neuropathy by approximately 60%. And the follow-up, the follow-up, which is called as the DCCT edic, you found a 50% reduction in nephropathy and almost a 57% reduction in macrovascular events. So in a clear medium like a type 1 diabetes, a glycemic strategy which targets 7 is far, far better than the conventional strategy. And, if you, and all of you all know the DCCT and the EDIC follow-up. 
And again, as I said, that there was a 57% risk reduction in what we are actually interested in, the macrovascular events. Now, if you look at the UK PDS, which is on newly diagnosed diabetics, the, the contrast between the standard and the intensive policy was approximately around 0.9% at the end of 10 years, and we targeted something closer to seven, and meaningfully endpoints, we, at, at the end of 10 years of, of the intensive treatment, we realized that it reduces microvascular complication, but what we were really in, interested in, the emergent risk reductions in MI came after the 10-year follow-up. The, the, so the follow-up data monitoring told us that the emergent risk reductions in MI, and probably that is what we call as the legacy effect today. So early intensive, catch them young, control them well, you will get benefit over a period of time. That's what the legacy effect or the molecular mimicry tells us. Now, we also know that uh, as we have good legacy effect, you also have bad legacy effect, which the VATT told us, that if you have patients who have actually loaded their gun with long-standing diabetes, with probably coronaries or probably a CKD, and you try to aggressively control them after 10 to 15 years, you will get into a problem. So also we know about the bad legacy. So we build up bad legacy, as Altamash pointed out, let us keep patients at around 8%, increase their coronary uh, damage, increase the damage in the kidneys, and then probably after 10 years, the ACP would come, would have some sense, and then say we need to control below seven, and all of that will come crashing down. So ACP does not consider the positive leg leg legacy effect of intensive blood sugar control at all. He spoke about ACCORD. ACCORD is a cobweb. This is, well, what did ACCORD uh, start off with? ACCORD had no arm in its protocol which looked at less than 7%. They were like cowboys, like Altamashis. They wanted to go below 6%, you know, go all guns blazing, go down to less than 6%. So that was the whole ACCORD study. A typical prescription, I've, I've gone to one of the centers in ACCORD in Minneapolis, and this is a typical prescription where you have a basal bolus, you have a GLP-1, you have an SU, you have a metformin, you have a TZD, you have, a, you have another secretor GOG, and you have an alpha glucosidase inhibitor. So the whole, whole thing given to the, the investigator was add whatever. Even if you had 6.1, add two, three drugs, get him down to uh, less than 6%. That is not a strategy which we'll ever use in clinical practice. So actually, polytherapy is extremely legal, especially when polytherapy, you add on multiple drugs at one time. That's what the ACCORD study actually did. So ACCORD was like a fast-moving train. If you pull all the brakes together, obviously you will derail. But why was mortality increased in the ACCORD? Again, not certain. Maybe the A1C redu reduction very fast. The drug combination, 80% of patients in the intensive arm were on TZD and again rosiglitazone unidentified hypoglycemia, weight gain or whether it's hypoglycemia associated autonomic failure. So this is a data which got published in 2010 about the epidemiological relation between A1C and all-cause mortality during a median 3.5 year follow-up in the ACCORD trial. If you look very closely at, at this, the difference in the, in the events were actually diverging somewhere around three, three and a half years. So if the uh, study had progressed to probably seven to eight or nine years, we would have had a difference in events in the intensive versus the standard group. Unfortunately, the death increased in the intensive group and it had to be preliminary stopped. But look at what the epidemiologic analysis at the end of it told us. Higher average on uh, treatment A1C was a very strong predictor of mortality than the A1C for the last interval of follow-up or the decrease of A1C in the first year. High average A1C was associated with greater risk of death. The one to two year delay between the initial reduction of A1C and the increase of mortality with intensive strategy suggests that factors other than the current A1C contributed. So it was not the, the, the drastic reduction in A1C. The analysis also do not support the hypothesis that overly rapid reduction of A1C from high levels increases death. Participant, this is most important, Altamash, you don't need to, I will send you the slides, my dear. You don't need to photograph it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, participants who were unable to reduce HB, uh, A1C after initiation of intensive therapy and continued to have average A1C more than 7% seem to be at greater risk than those with an average A1C less than 7%. So people who were resistant to treatment above 7% were the ones who developed problems. 
Again, this is data from Matthew Riddle, the same paper, which tells us on the follow-up, there's a steady increase of risk from 6 to 9% with intensive strategy, and it kind of comes together at 7%. So there's an increased risk of mortality with intensive strategy occurred above an HbA1c of 7%. And those patients who were at more than 7% and were resistant to come below were the ones who were actually collapsing and dying. Again, this is an article of BMG in 2010, again saying the same thing, that pe people who do not respond promptly with a fall in A1C may be more likely to die in the ACCORD study. This is the EPIC Norfolk study, old study almost 20 years back, which told us that as the A1C quartiles go up, it's an important predictor of cardiovascular risk. And above 7%, as you can see, cardiovascular death and all-cause death goes much, much higher as compared to between 5.5 to 6.9. This is another uh, uh, epidemiological analysis which came out last year, published in NEGM, and it looked at what are the relative importance of risk factors for acute MI and stroke, and right up there you can see is glycosylated hemoglobin. Another epidemiological analysis published this year in March 2019 actually looked at what, how, how does early glycemic control matters. The, the slide is really, really very, uh, crowded. So on the y-axis is the year, so it's one to one to seven years, and on the x-axis is the uh, is the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, and seventh year. The lowest one is between six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, and nine to ten. So as the years go on, if your if your A1C worsens, you can see your micro, macro, and mortality worsens. So this is an epidemiological data over a period of time, which tells us that among patients with newly diagnosed diabetes and at least 10 years of survival, A1C levels more than 6.5% for the first year after diagnosis were associated with worse outcomes. Immediate intensive treatment for newly diagnosed diabetes may be necessary to avoid irremedial long-term risk for diabetes complications and mortality. And now there's a complete change in how we treat. Uh, the, the ACP looks at ACCORD, which is more than 10 years back. Today we are using drugs like empagliflozin and the GLP-1. You know that the NNT for statins is 100, but if you look at an SGLT-2 and liraglutide is 39 to 98. These benefits of SGLT-2s and GLP-1 were not even thought about when they made the ACP guidance. So ACP has been missing the consideration of several newer medication class where we can get them down to lower values. Even Altamash will believe that we can get them down to 6% on SGLT2 plus metformin or a DPP-4 or a GLP-1 plus metformin without any harm on any of the systems as such. So who are the many in the regional a A1C goal? For many, he spoke about many, most. So who are the many that who should come to around 7%? Now this is uh, data from the Carolina Data Warehouse where they have more than 70,000 patients. And if you look at it, uh, approximately 50% of patients from this database have an A1C less than 7%. But if you look at it above, these are all patients in the age group of 30 to 50 who have a very long, the, the survival of patients at 80 years of age in the US is approximately eight years unlike India. So you have these patients who are in this control and by using certain drugs you can get them to better control. So you have 49% of patients who can actually get better by using the newer drugs. If you look at patients who are under the age of 50, which is almost 20% of the population, 39% were then on a goal of less than 7%. Now if you just add on patients who are on no drugs, or drugs which does not use a secretor GOG or insulin, you could have 41% reach the goal of less than 7%. So it's using the right drug, you can get them to 6.5 and 6 and not cause a problem. And young age group of 50 who have probably a 20 year survival. Again, if you look at women under the age of 50 who could potentially get pregnant, in their database there was 42%. But if you use drugs which do not cause hypoglycemia or just on lifestyle measures, you could go 43% onto a goal of less than 7%. Why can't we do this? Use the right drug. Don't use drugs which cause hypoglycemia. Again, specific to patients Time's who have cut. Yeah, yeah, give me two minutes. Seconds. Altamash had very little data, so I'm taking. Yeah, 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 sir, I'm finishing. So, specific to patients, again, if you get them 
uh, you can get them 41% to goal. Again, they didn't look at the risk of complications when they made this goal. How about any, I'm sure there will be diabetics in this population. How many of you all would keep a target of 8%? The, all of us would like to a target of less than 7%. So goals are goals. Our best evidence suggests that A1C level attend and how it is approached is very important. You have secretagogues, non-secretagogues, and by using non-secretagogues and, ins no, and insulin, you can get to a goal. So the ACP guidelines are completely senile. They are directionless. They took them 10 years. They looked at AD, uh, ACCORD, ADVANCE, and VADT data, did not look at the newer guidelines at all. The take-home message is the ADA recommends de-intensification or complication, simplification of complex regimen to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia. If this can be achieved within the individualized A1C target, the key is to individualize A1C target on patient factors, and any de-intensification should not be just based on numbers. It should be based on the presence of severe hypoglycemia and not on numbers. Thank you so much. I stop midway. Thank you. Wonderful.